All right, everyone, welcome to Meet the Experts, uh, Ocean Sniffing Airplanes and Climate Science Around Antarctica. We are so excited to welcome you, all of you today to Meet the Experts. I'm Katie Wolfson with the UCAR Center for Science Education, uh, and we love having all of you join us for Meet the Experts. This is a bi-weekly program where we get to meet experts from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and we get to talk to different experts every other week. Uh, we might talk to, there's really amazing jobs here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. You can be a scientist, a pilot, a mechanic, a computer scientist, a chef, an educator. Um, you can work in augmented reality with supercomputers. There's so many different careers that you can follow here. And we are so lucky that we get to talk to all of you today and hear your questions uh, and connect you with different experts from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we get started. I'm going to ask everybody to keep your cameras off and your microphone, microphones muted for now, um, just to avoid distractions. Uh, if you need any help at all, please type in the chat. Uh, you, Tim and I are here on standby to help you out if you need any help. Um, there is closed captioning available that you can toggle on and off in Zoom for you. So feel free to use that if you like. And throughout the program, you might have questions based on what you see and what you hear. Maybe Britt is going to say something that makes you wonder something. We would love to hear your questions. So please type those questions in the chat throughout the program. We'll also have a time at the end for questions as well. Uh, but feel free to type questions about things you wonder before, as well as anything you see and hear during the program today. Uh, we can't wait to hear your questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our expert. Uh, today, we are talking to Britt Stevens, who is a senior scientist with the Earth Observing Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He studies global climate, uh, global carbon, um, uh, <laughs> the global carbon cycle, and uses airplanes to do that. Uh, so Britt, can you tell us a little bit more about why you study carbon cycles? Sure, thanks Katie. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I'm gonna share my screen and give a little PowerPoint presentation um, and then we can just have um, questions or discussions afterwards. So can you see my first slide? We sure can. Okay, I just wanted to start uh, by explaining why um, carbon dioxide is interesting and, uh, and what it actually is. So carbon dioxide is a, a gas in the atmosphere and we abbreviate that CO2. Uh, there's not a lot of it, a lot of it. This graph shows um, values between 300 and 400 parts per million. And, and this is a famous curve called the Keeling curve, which runs from the late 1950s till about 2010. And CO2 is going up in the atmosphere. And that's a big concern because even though there's not much of it, it's responsible for keeping the earth the temperature it is. And so um, because it absorbs heat, when the concentration goes up, um, we absorb more heat and that's causing global warming. One interesting fact is that we would have expected CO2 to go up almost twice as fast if everything that we emitted from cars and power plants stayed in the atmosphere. And that's shown by the yellow line here. And the difference is um, a result of the world's oceans and forests taking up uh, more carbon dioxide every year than they used to previously. So th they're taking up about half of what we emit, which is great. Things would be a lot worse if they didn't, but we don't understand uh, why they're doing that or what, uh, how the processes actually work well enough to say if it'll continue in the future. So that's really why we wanna study carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And my job is really trying to figure out where all the CO2 we emit ends up, in the, whether it's the forests or in the ocean and why. But first I wanted to go back and tell you a little bit more about how I got to where I am today. I grew up in a small town in Northeastern Oregon, uh, shown by this red star. Uh, and it was a great place to grow up because we had um, really high mountains and these really deep canyons and lots of great places for um, doing things in the outdoors, uh, exploring nature. And uh, so I was, I was always outside and, and you know developed a real appreciation for nature and a real strong curiosity about how the natural wor world worked. I also had um, a great earth sciences teacher in high school um, who would take us out on uh, backpacking trips and river rafting trips and teach us all about the geology of the area. So when I got to college, I ended up studying earth sciences uh, and actually took some atmospheric chemistry classes in college as well. It wasn't until actually about a year after college that I finally decided um, 
uh, that I wanted to go to grad school and, and, and wanted to pursue this as a career. Um, and I always thought it took me that long to decide, but it turns out I had um, an inkling a little bit sooner. I found this uh, recently at home, which is something I wrote for a school assignment when I was seven. And it says, when I grow up, I want to fly an airplane or be a sports player or a scientist. And when I have time, I'll probably rest. And I live in LA. So I'm not a sports player and I don't live in LA, um, but two out of four isn't, isn't too bad. So after college, I got a job as a research assistant for the US Geological Survey. And this picture in the top left is of me in Northern Manitoba, uh, helping out in a project uh, measuring how much carbon dioxide was coming out of the soils during winter. So you can see a little white bucket on the back of this eight wheeled vehicle. Um, and we would go set that down in different places and measure how fast the carbon dioxide went up inside the little bucket. But uh, the fun part was driving this truck around and. That experience and, uh, and a number of other um, sort of field project uh, projects I went on made me realize I could, you know, I could study something I was interested in, but still get to do fun things outside. So at that point, I was hooked, and I decided to go back to graduate school. Uh, and I went to a school called the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, which is in San Diego, California. Uh, and, the, and what I really liked to do was to build things. And so what I did for my <clears throat> graduate project was to build an instrument. And that's shown in the bottom picture here that measures oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So um, about 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen and that's what we breathe. Uh, and if we measure it at the same time as CO2, you can actually tell a lot about what's affecting CO2. So I built this instrument and took it out on some ships. The picture on the right is uh, about a thousand miles from land out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where I, I was measuring oxygen and CO2 in the air, but I got to help out um, servicing some of the instruments that are out on buoys. Um, and, uh, and so I got to continue doing, doing fun things outside uh, while I was in graduate school. Once I graduated, I uh, came to Boulder, Colorado, uh, and uh, then got a job for NCAR. And my graduate degree is in oceanography. And, when I tell people that, they always they always ask me what the heck an oceanographer is doing in Colorado, and don't I know that the ocean is actually not uh, you know anywhere near here? Um, but I study the atmosphere, and and you can do that anywhere. And I actually also study the forests. So this picture on the left is um, a place called Niwot Ridge, which is just up the mountains here from Boulder, uh, where I deployed some instruments to measure carbon dioxide in the air, and I'm I'm staring at them trying to figure out. Uh, probably why they're not working. Um, also, after starting working here, I uh, got started to get involved in doing research from aircraft. So the top right picture is um, uh, one of the first aircraft projects I've worked on. It was called COBRA. There's, it's very important in atmospheric research to have a catchy acronym for your field projects. So this one was uh, flying around in a, sort of a small uh, jet called a Citation II, and uh, I'm the thing I'm touching is a glass flask. We were using those to collect air and bring it back into the laboratory to do measurements on measurements on that air. And the bottom picture is uh, me on the NCAR C-130 aircraft, which is a really large cargo military cargo plane. Um, and the instrument I'm behind is actually that same instrument I took out on the ship, but now I've I'm trying to uh, modify it to work on an airplane. Um, because it's, it's a lot better if you can make the measurements while you're flying along and not have to bring that air back to a lab. But this instrument still sort of looks like the kind of thing you put together in your garage on a weekend. It's not, uh, it wasn't really uh, well built at that point, but another great thing about working at NCAR is that there are some, some wonderful engineers here and I was able to team up with some engineers and rebuild this instrument from scratch. So this is a, a picture of what it looks like now. Um, and the picture on the the picture on the left is of, of the, the whole rack that bolts to the floor of the airplane. The picture on the right is of the sort of the inside of it. And the way it works is um, the way it measures oxygen is that it has a, a lamp with a tiny amount of xenon in it. And it's just like the fluorescent lights in the ceiling, maybe of your classroom, that glows when you put energy into it, but it emits a particular wavelength of light that's absorbed by oxygen. And then there's a detector um, and, and we just use pumps to pull air in from outside the airplane and push it past this lamp and we measure how much 
uh, how much um, of the light is absorbed in that air. So if, if the light is, uh, is just a little bit dimmer, we know there's more oxygen in the air that's in between the lamp and the detector and vice versa. So, um, so why go to all this trouble to measure oxygen and carbon dioxide from aircraft? I'll, I'll now switch over to just say a bit more about the sort of science questions we're trying to get at. This is a schematic of what's called the global carbon budget. It's just sort of like your bank account, but for the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And on the left are the sources. So every year we're emitting almost 35, it's billion tons. That's what that GT stands for, gigatons, if you know your units. Um, so uh, 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year from uh, making electricity in power plants or driving cars or other industrial processes. And then about 6 billion tons from just cutting down forests, primarily uh, in the Amazon and, and burning those trees. And as I mentioned, about half of that stays in the atmosphere and that's what's causing CO2 to go up every year. But uh, almost um, 30% we believe um, is taken up by forests and about 25% or so or 23% is taken up by the oceans. And one of the key ways we know these two numbers is actually for measuring oxygen because when the forests take up that CO2, they do it through photosynthesis and they produce oxygen while we do that. So, um, so oxygen has already helped get these numbers, but the, the catch is we, don't, we still don't really know why, say, for example, the ocean is taking up that much and where. We think that about half of this amount that's being taken up by the ocean every year is taken up around Antarctica. And the next slide I have says a little bit more about why that is. So the ocean around Antarctica, we call the Southern Ocean. Um, and it goes all the way around. And because the winds also can blow all the way around, they never run into any land, they can push really hard on the water. And the currents that they produce end up bringing water up from below. They sort of blow the water away at the, at the surface. This is a cross section with what would be the South Pole on the left and heading to the north on the right of the currents inside the ocean. So because the deep water comes up around Antarctica and it's been, it's been deep for hundreds to maybe a thousand years, it's never seen uh, the impact of humans burning fossil fuels. So it comes up and all of a sudden sees this atmosphere with a lot more CO2 in it and it absorbs a lot of CO2. So that's why there's a big sink there. And it's really important for the climate system, but it's a really complicated area because of all of the different uh, processes that are going on. So when that water comes up, it warms, it's cold down deep, and then it starts to flow south and the sun shines on it, warms it up. And if you warm up water, it actually, the gases in it become less soluble and they want to sort of bubble out. If you leave a soda can out in the sun on a hot day uh, and open it, it'll actually have a lot more pressure than, uh, than if it was just out of your, out of your refrigerator. Uh, and the, the opposite of that is that when you cool the water, sometimes these waters go over towards Antarctica and then and cool off and sink, you actually absorb both oxygen and carbon dioxide. But if you have a bunch of algae that are just doing photosynthesis in the surface water, they actually um, do, do the opposite with oxygen and CO2. So they produce oxygen and they take up carbon dioxide, just like a plant in, in, your, in your garden or in your house. So, um, if we measure oxygen and CO2 and they go in opposite directions, we know that biology is what's uh, affecting CO2. And if they go in the same direction, we know uh, it's the heating and cooling. So that's uh, why we've wanted to measure oxygen and carbon dioxide over the Southern Ocean for a long time. Um, but it's hard to do because the Southern Ocean is so far from anywhere uh, that people live, um, it's hard to get to and it's also a very harsh environment. So we had a project where we were measuring from a ship. And this is a picture of the ship in the top left. Uh, it's called the Lawrence M. Gould. And it goes back and forth between Chile and Antarctica almost every month to resupply uh, people who are doing research on, on Antarctica. Uh, but we were measuring from the ship. The instrument is shown on the left here. Um, and if you look in this picture in the bottom right, there's a tiny white thing on this black mass, which is um, the inlet where we were sucking in our air. And we, we were putting that up there and the captain was laughing and making bets with his crew about how long it was gonna stay up there. And we didn't really appreciate um, what, you know, why they were doing that. But then uh, a year or so later, I saw this nice documentary uh, put out by Rutgers University. I'm just gonna show you what, what the, the first 10 seconds of the trailer 
and see if you can see that little white inlet here. It's, it's, it goes really quickly, but um, this just um, gives you an idea. There it is right there of what the conditions are like if, if you're going back and forth in a ship over, over the Southern Ocean. And it can be quite you know, unpleasant for people. So uh, we finally realized that a better way to do this was to fly an airplane. And so we came up with the idea for a study uh, which is called ORCA. As I mentioned, it's important to have a catchy acronym. This one stands for O2N2 Ratio and CO2 Airborne Southern Ocean Study. Uh, we actually report the oxygen concentrations as a ratio to nitrogen, um, but really it's just so we could get the O and, and ORCAs there. Uh, this is a picture of the airplane flying over um, some icebergs uh, near the Antarctic Peninsula. And then the bottom is a map from Google Earth um, What's shown is a satellite picture of uh, chlorophyll, which is essentially um, how much algae there is photosynthesizing at the time of the project. And then the, the different colored lines are all of the flight tracks from where we flew. So we typically would, we were based in Punta Arenas, Chile, and this was during January and February of 2016. And January and February is summer in the Southern hemisphere. So, um, so all of the algae was growing um, and it was, and the sun was heating the surface. So we would typically fly uh, at high altitude over to the Antarctic Peninsula and then descend down. Uh, and we would do a series of what we called porpoise maneuvers where we would go up and down out of the atmospheric boundary layer. So that portion of the atmosphere that's actually um, turbulently mixing with turbulence and can actually um, pick up gases uh, from the ocean surface. So the last thing I wanted to show you was, a. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot one extra slide to just tell you a little bit more about the Gulfstream 5 jet, which is uh, based here at NCAR. If you're local in the area um, uh, and they have an air show at the, the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, sometimes uh, we roll it out for people to look at. But you can tell by looking that it's not a typical airplane. It has all these extra probes sticking out the top and bottom of it and things hanging off the wing. And those are all uh, scientific instruments or inlets for sucking air into them. And the picture on the bottom right is what it looks like inside uh, during a, a typical campaign. It's, there are very few seats. It's mostly all instruments. Uh, so it's a flying laboratory. And it's, it's kind of like you're flying inside the instrument. When the plane gets down into the boundary layer, you can feel it bouncing around. So you know you're in air that's, that's turbulent and is, uh, is is connected to the surface and all of a sudden you see the gas concentrations change and you sort of know instantly what's what's going on. So to, to give you a little bit more of an idea what that's like, I have a video from uh, one particular flight during ORCAs. It was an eight hour flight, but it's sped up here. Um, and the left will be a picture out the front of the plane. And the top right is a map of where the plane is. So it'll, you'll see a red line and it's starting here in Punta Arenas. And the bottom right is the graph. Um, there's going to be a gray line showing the altitude on this left axis, and then a red line showing oxygen on this right axis, and a blue line showing carbon dioxide uh, or CO2 on the right as well. So just, just remember that oxygen is red and CO2 is blue on this graph. So I'll go ahead and start playing it. Here we go. We're taking off from Punta Arenas, and we got a little bit of ice on the front of the camera going through those wet clouds. Um, but as you see, it slowly sublimates away, um, which that happens a lot when you're in a commercial airliner. Uh, and we climb up out of Punta Arenas and then kind of do a, a little up and down maneuver where we're going in and out of the stratosphere, uh, which is uh, sort of isolated from, from the surface and has different gas concentrations. It looks like we're in outer space um, uh, on the camera. Uh, unfortunately, in real life, it's not quite as that dramatic. Your eye adjusts and it doesn't look like the blackness of space. But I wanted to pause it real quick. Um, so we're about two and a half hours in and we've just gone across Drake Passage. Um, I showed you that other video and I've been across Drake Passage on a ship and I can tell you this is definitely the way to do it <laughs> on an airplane. You get Plus you get to go home and have a nice warm meal and, and, and sleep on a bed that's not moving around. Uh, and we're starting to descend. And uh, you can see a lot of structure in the, in the little lines for oxygen and CO2 that's a result of going in and out of the stratosphere. But before we go into the uh, boundary layer, I wanted to ask people to, to think about what, they, what, what you think oxygen and CO2 are going to do. So we're about to go down really low over the water during summer 
uh, off of Antarctica. Do you think both oxygen and CO2 will go up because the sun is heating the water and making them come out? Do you think both oxygen and CO2 will go down because uh, the water is cooling off before sinking? Or do you think oxygen will go up and CO2 will go down because of all the algae photosynthesizing? So I, if you want to type into chat, uh, both up, both down, or oxygen up, or you can say O2 up, CO2 down. I'll just give a few, I'll just give a minute for people to sort of think about what, what, what might happen. And, and, and I'll just share that at this point, we didn't know what was going to happen either. That's why we took this airplane down there. Um, we had somebody on the science team who thought we weren't going to see any changes in carbon dioxide um, at all and was sort of willing to bet that we weren't because of some computer model runs we had that said said that we wouldn't. But I'll go ahead and play it here um, now that you've had so, time Rick, to think before, about it. Before yeah, we you play it, we, do, we have some responses. Uh, oh, yeah, let's person, look at them. Yeah, you know, one person said goes up. Uh, another person said CO2 up and O2 down. And then a uh, third person says O2 up. All right, those are all good guesses. Um, so watch the red is oxygen and, and you'll see as we get low here, oxygen goes way up and then this blue CO2 trace goes down. So here we are flying around in the air that's feeling the surface and we have really high oxygen concentrations and really low CO2 concentrations. And we're looking out the window to see if we can see any seals or penguins. And now we're doing these porpoise maneuvers that I mentioned where we go in and out of the boundary layer, um, sort of above and below the clouds. And we're gonna do that about five times. Uh, and of course, it all happens much more slowly in real life. Um, but it's fun <laughs> to see it this, this fast. And so what you'll notice if you look at the red and blue <clears throat> lines and the gray line is every time the plane went up and down, CO2 went up and down and oxygen went up and down. And they're always going in opposite directions. So when we're down low, like, well, this one, we didn't get out of the clouds, just barely can see the water there. Um, see, uh, oxygen was high again. And as we're coming up, oxygen goes low. And then we do one more, one more low porpoise. And then we're going to do a series of um, sort of higher profiles to maybe 20,000 feet on the way back to Punta Arena. So it takes about a about two minutes for the, the video to play. Um, I'll just let it go. If anyone has any questions they wanted to ask now, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. And I also have a summary at the end. Yeah, so we have a question from Amy's group asking, so when you're showing us when you were in the sky and it looked like you were in space, do you ever travel at night? Uh, if you can, and if you do, can you see the stars really well? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we do these flights at night sometimes, and um, I, I, I don't, I don't remember seeing great stars from the plane. Um, I think that's because just the lights inside the plane always make it so that your eyes aren't really adjusted well. But um, you do see that you see the moon sometimes. I, with this great experience flying out of Anchorage, sort of to the North Pole and back, where the um, the moon was direct in front of the nose of the airplane, full moon. So you could sit all the way in the back of the airplane, um, look down the aisle, and you could see the moon right out the cockpit window of the airplane. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, um, I think uh, if you turn all the lights off inside, maybe you could, uh, you could see the stars. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, we have another question here asking, so in your job, do you get to travel to other states to see how much CO2 is in other states uh, or which state has the most CO2? Yeah, that's a great question. For the United States, the highest concentrations are on the Eastern seaboard where there's so many more people and cities and cars and power plants. Um, but we've done measurements around the Rocky Mountains in the, in the, you know, the West. We measured in Utah and um, Arizona and Colorado. Here we are coming into land. You can see the landing gear just came down. Um, and for that study, we were trying to figure out how much CO2 the forests were taking up and measuring really small differences between, between those states. Um, during summer, uh, there's a lot more uh, photosynthesis in the, in, the, in the 
forests on the eastern part of the country. So you, you get CO2 kind of goes down as the wind blows across. And then if you're right downwind of New York City or, or Boston, it would be quite high. I just wanted to show one other thing here now that we've landed in Punta Arenas, which is um, this little cartoon again, just highlighting that for these big profiles we did on the way back, every time the plane was down low, where this, see the gray is down near the surface, oxygen was high and CO2 was low. So because they went in opposite directions, we knew that uh, biology, the algae in the surface was what was dominating the CO2 exchange at that time. So that was something we didn't know before and now we're working on incorporating that into computer models that are trying to predict what the system's gonna do in the future. And I'm happy to take more questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Britt. Uh, students, feel free to type if you have more questions in the chat. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Oh, we have one uh, from Ms. Gomez's class, in, who I believe is in California, asking, when you're on a plane, do you ever feel the plane moving? I've never been on a plane, but how does it feel moving? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Uh, you do feel it moving. When, uh, when you're really high and the air is really smooth, sometimes you don't feel it moving at all and you could, you could almost forget you were in an airplane. Um, but when the plane's down near the surface, it bounces around quite a bit. And um, uh, for these types of studies where we're only down near the surface for a few minutes, most people you know, do just fine. It, it's like kind of being on a bumpy roller coaster for two or three minutes and then you go back up where the air is smooth. Um, but we've done studies where we fly around the mountains and then it's bouncy the whole, <laughs> the whole eight hours. Um, or I was on a project with the C-130 where we were flying over down low over the ocean for eight hours. And, and unfortunately, some people's stomachs don't really like that kind of thing. So, um, uh, it, but that doesn't keep them from being atmospheric scientists. So, uh, so it's kind of luck of the draw whether you have, have a tough stomach or not. Oh man, not for, not for the people who get plane sick very much, right? Um, we have a question um, from one of our homeschool groups asking, what is behind you right now? Oh yeah, well that instrument I showed you a, a picture of in one of my slides is right, is right there. It's open because we're working on improving it before the next project. Uh, that's one of the that's one of the lamps that goes inside of it. Um, the thing behind me on the right is uh, a bit hard to see, but that's another instrument rack that's going to go in um, these C-130 planes that have uh, skis on them that go back and forth to um, Antarctica to uh, resupply McMurdo Station, which is south of uh, New Zealand. And so it's just going to ride along and do measurements while they're resupplying, um, resupplying the the stations there back there you see a bunch of aluminum gas bottles we have to calibrate our measurements against air that we know isn't changing so we do that with these it's like a giant scuba tank um, and then there's something right behind me that we call the big blue box it's a very descriptive uh, name but that's uh, it's like a wine rack for those cylinders we have to keep them insulated um, and, and on their sides so that the gases don't separate Good question. Our California students like the big blue box name. <laughs> I got a big LOL in the chat. <laughs> uh, we have another question um, from one of our Colorado school groups asking, uh, what does it mean by ocean sniffing planes when it looks like you're in the sky? Yeah, well, we're not sniffing the water exactly, but the air just above the water. So um, yeah. It, if the, the we stick the uh, little tubes outside the plane and we have a pump that's sucking air in. So I think of it like flying along, sort of sniffing with your nose. If we could, we would fly 10 feet, you know, two feet above the water and sniff as close as we could. But um, for safety reasons, we can only get down to about uh, 500 feet. Um, but the instruments are sensitive enough that we get a pretty good, we get a pretty good whiff of the gases uh, either coming off the ocean or, or going in. So Britt, would it be fair to say that pretty much everything in the, in the air that you're flying through probably came out of the ocean and not very much of it came from somewhere else? 
Uh, around Antarctica, all of the changes we're seeing are from, from the ocean. If you fly around here, the hard part is separating what, how much is the forest and how much was a car and how much was um, the ocean you know, before it got onto the continent. Um, there's, when NCAR opens back up, there's a public um, exhibit uh, and there's a CO2 instrument on the roof of the Mesa lab at NCAR. And so people who are local can go see what the uh, CO2 con concentrations like around here. The, those changes I was showing you were, were only one or two parts per million CO2. Around here, every night it goes up by about a hundred parts per million just because uh, wow. cars and burning things and to heat our homes um, has that much larger effect. Wow, okay, we'll, do, we'll just go another minute just to see if anyone has any final questions. In the meantime, I have a question for you, Britt. Um, we think you are a science superhero with all the research that you're doing. And we're <laughs> curious if you, what would you consider your science superpower to be that lets you do your job? Um, that's a tough question. I, you know, I, I've always liked taking, taking things apart and trying to put them back together. Um, uh, you know, electrical or mechanical type, type things, you know, if you know what a VCR is, I can remember taking one of those apart back in the day, but, um, you know, anything that breaks, but, you know, when you do that, you tend to break things a lot. And so I, I you know, I guess in the world of building instruments and flying them on airplanes, I, I, I take pride in my ability to, um, know when an instrument's broken and know what's wrong with it and be able to fix it. And sometimes that happens, you know, right before takeoff when everybody else is, you know, ready to go and your instrument's broken and it's a really high pressure situation and you have to, you have to quickly figure out what's wrong and, and, and come up with a fix with it so that everybody else can go take off and, and, and do the research flight. So, um, and, 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 I, fi and I, I find it fun doing that too. That's awesome, awesome. So sometimes in science, you got it's good to break things so you know how to fix them later. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so if you break things, students, you just say, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm a scientist in training. <laughs> All right. We have another question in the chat. Um, oh, a couple more questions. Great. Um, have you had any really rough weather situations, Britt? Uh, you know, our, our pilots, do. Uh, NCAR has four professional pilots, and they do a really good job of monitoring the weather and, and and keeping us out of trouble. The, the, the scientists always, you know, uh, we do measurements for the types of things I study where we're just sucking in air, but we also do measurements for people who want to study severe weather or clouds or thunderstorms. And so we often have the situation where the scientists want to fly right through the middle of a thunderstorm because that's <laughs> the part they don't understand very well because they haven't, nobody else has done, <laughs> done that before. And so, um, there's always this, uh, you know, a lot of teamwork to figure out how how closely that can be done uh, safely. Um, I haven't been on many of those projects because they're not as, you know, the flying is not as, you know, as pleasant with all that bouncing around. We were flying uh, really high once over a thunderstorm, and the the airplane did a, um, you know, hit a uh, updraft and then a downdraft, and 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 people who weren't um, seat belted in kind of. Um, got bounced around, but uh, I, you know, I talked to the pilots afterwards and they said that the, the, you know, the airplanes are designed to hold much worse than that. It's really just the people that they have to worry about um, bouncing around. So, so luckily I haven't been in anything too rough on our planes. Great question. All right, we have another one from California saying, now that the COVID-19 pandemic has happened, is it hard for you guys to travel or fix things or anything like that? Yeah, that's been a, that's been a real challenge. Uh, for what NCAR does in supporting um, field campaigns on these aircraft, a lot of that has had to be delayed. Um, first projects were delayed a year, now they're being mostly delayed another year. Uh, we had a, there's a big project planned um, based out of South Korea to study um, the atmospheric chemistry that happens when all of these um, thunderstorms over Asia lift this air really high into the atmosphere. Um, that's been delayed a couple times um, because of the travel restrictions. Other people have instruments that are out in the field that break down and 
that's been um, hard to travel to get to to fix. Um, the The whole Antarctic program that the United States National Science Foundation runs was pretty much put on hold last year, and um, they're only doing sort of um, part of what they would like to do this coming year. So pretty much uh, everything's just been delayed. But I will say other people are, are, are learning a lot about how the atmosphere works because we did kind of this experiment where people didn't drive or fly for a couple months. So there's been a lot of interesting scientific results to come out of that. Wonderful. Well, it looks like that is all our questions we have in the chat for right now. So thank you so, so much, Britt, for sharing a little bit about what you do um, and taking us behind the scenes in your lab a little bit there. Um, that was really fun. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot. I hope our students today learned a lot too. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, we want to uh, I want to remind all of our students that this is a bi-weekly program um, through the end of May. So we do have another program coming up in two weeks. Um, you can join us in two weeks on April 29th. Uh, we're going to be talking about testing the limits of weather predictability with Falco Jute. Um, so that's going to be 11 a.m on April 29th. So we hope that we will see you there again. Um, in the meantime, um, feel free to um, say goodbye in the chat. Um, we loved having you there. We'll have this recording as well as past recordings of all of our other Meet the Experts available on our website. Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, and thank you so much, Britt. Um, we had a lot of fun today. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Awesome. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.